Oh, good morning. And uh, welcome to a special session of uh, the Family Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm uh, Dr. Mike McGill. I'm the chairman of the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine here at the University of Utah. And uh, it's uh, terrific to see so many folks here. Uh, we have uh, folks from across the university, uh, from across the community, and across the state, and maybe even further watching on uh, streaming video for this special session of Family Medicine Grand Rounds. I'd also uh, like to welcome a couple uh, folks uh, from out of town who are here with Dr. Grundy uh, visiting for this week. Uh, Dr. Andrew Morris Singer from Primary Care Progress, uh, uh, an organization in Boston that is interested in uh, advancing primary care, working with medical students and residents from medical schools uh, across the country. And also doc Dr. Nancy Stacy, who's the Vice President of uh, for North, North America and Smarter Cities and Healthcare uh, for IBM uh, Corporation. Um, this uh, session will also uh, be posted on uh, YouTube, and uh, you can find a link to it on our Department of Family and Preventive Medicine website or the Utah Academy of Family Physicians website uh, after the session. This is a time of uh, terrific uh, turmoil and transformation in American healthcare, uh, both in the delivery and in the payment for healthcare. Uh, we have, uh, of course, the Affordable Care Act at the federal level, but that's really only part of the puzzle. Uh, there's an enormous amount of change going on amongst uh, uh, commercial payers, uh, many delivery systems, uh, other governmental uh, uh, sources of health care, such as the Department of Defense and the VA. Uh, there's change happening all around us, perhaps more uh, now than at any time in uh, most of our careers. And as part of this change, one of the things that's happening, and I'm sure you're aware, is that uh, recognition uh, is growing, that an effective healthcare system that delivers on the triple aim of improved quality of care, improved health, and lower cost of care, any system that delivers on that uh, promise that we can achieve those things together has a robust primary care system as part of it. And uh, our speaker today is uh, as influential as anyone, and in fact, I would say there was no one in the country more inf influential in advancing the renovation of primary care uh, than Dr. Paul Grundy. Uh, he, he is the uh, leader of the movement to create patient-centered medical homes uh, and has been for a number of years. He's doing so in his position as the du Director of Healthcare Transformation for uh, the IBM Corporation. Uh, Dr. Grundy uh, has a uh, remarkable background, uh, spent a good deal of his childhood in West Africa as a child of uh, uh, Quaker missionaries, went into the U.S. State Department where he did some of the early work for the United States in HIV AIDS in Africa, uh, served as a physician in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow during the fall of the Soviet Union, transition into the new uh, Russian government. Uh, all this he did after having uh, uh, graduated from uh, the University of California, San Francisco uh, School of Medicine and gotten his Master of Public Health degree at UC Berkeley. Um, uh, Dr. Grundy has been at IBM for uh, about the last uh, six or eight years, and in that role is also the founder and president of the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative, which is uh, an organization of Fortune 100 companies, insurance companies, professional organizations advancing the development of medical homes. Uh, we're also uh, delighted to uh, call him one of our own as an adjunct professor in the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine here at University of Utah. Now, Dr. Grundy has received numerous recognitions for his work, uh, is uh, going to be recognized as uh, one of only uh, uh, very, very few folks in the country uh, who are receiving awards for uh, advancing quality of care by the National uh, Committee for Quality Assurance. And he's also uh, uh, going to be changing the education of physicians as a member of the board of directors of the ACGME that oversees residency training in our country. And uh, just last week uh, was uh, an example of the kind of influence that he has uh, is uh, uh, some testimony that was given at the uh, House Ways and Means Committee. And I'm going to show you that now, a video of that, to give you an idea of the impact Dr. Grundy's had. And this is testimony by 
the past president of the Colorado Academy of Family Physicians, uh, talking about the influence that Dr. Grundy's had on transformation of his practice, the practice of primary care uh, in general in the United States. So a uh, short clip just to give you an idea for, by way of a further introduction. Dr. Bender is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Herger and distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Health. I'm Dr. John Bender. I'm a family physician in Fort Collins, Colorado, and I'm CEO of Miramont Family Medicine, which is a network of patient centered and medical homes. Now, in 2002, my wife, Teresa, and I moved back to Larimer County, where we're from, and we purchased one of the oldest practices in Fort Collins, Colorado. They'd been there for over 40 years, and were basically doing things the same as they had in the 1970s. They left me one computer and one employee. That was 10 years ago. Today, we have over 50 employees, 14 providers, including eight physicians. We have over 80 computers in a centralized data center serving four different uh, uh, parts of our state, and we have uh, uh, about 27,000 patients. Now, during the same period of time in Lemmer County, 34 primary care physicians uh, closed their doors or stopped providing primary care services. Eight of these were actual bankruptcies. And yet at the same time, we saw a doubling in the number of emergency room beds and an increase by the number of emergency room physicians by 50%, suggesting that if patients didn't have a patient-centered medical home like myself, they were going to the emergency room at a later stage of their illness for a higher cost, increasing health care premiums for everyone across the state. Now, how is it that Miramont was able to double in size, grow at 34% per year to the size that we achieved in this economy while other family physicians were saying, I give up and walking away? Well, part of it was in 2007, we made the conscious decision that we were no longer going to just focus on volume. We were going to make sure that we had a high quality product that was safe and efficient. And we believed that if we built the best product in the marketplace, the consumers would vote with their feet and we would be able to maintain our solvency. Because after all, I didn't want to be the 35th practice to close or the ninth physician to bankrupt. And so we pursued NCQA, Patient Centered Medical Home Recognition. That's the National Committee of Quality Assurance. We achieved level three, which is the highest level of patient centered medical home. It basically meant that we, after a six month audit period, were able to show improvements in our workflow and the way we retooled things so that we could deliver team approach care. We also had, uh, for example, a patient portal where patients could go online, look up their labs, see their uh, clinic record. They could send me a HIPAA compliant email or they could uh, schedule appointments. And we also uh, conducted uh, care coordination through the transitions of care as people went from hospitals to nursing homes, et cetera. Our next big break came in 2008 with the multi-payer uh, patient-centered medical home pilot. This was the brainchild of Dr. Paul Grundy and others at IBM who uh, had compelled the top payers in the United States WellPoint, United Health Group, Cigna, Aetna, and Humana to test the patient center medical home model. Uh, it was based on some of the beliefs uh, that in work that uh, Dr. Barbara Starfield had published 10 years earlier, uh, suggesting that if we put an emphasis on primary care, we could bend the health uh, cost curve. So with that, Dr. Grundy. Thank you, Mike, and it's wonderful to be back <clears throat> back here. Um, this morning I woke up uh, and I travel a lot and I sometimes have track, keep, trouble keeping track of where I am and I had put on this beautiful red t-shirt and, and I looked at the mirror and I said, aha, I'm in Hatu. <laughs> Go Utes! <laughs> uh, it's, it's a ple pleasure to be here. Um, you know, the story that you just heard from Mike Bender is, is in fact, your own story here. Um, I'm going to get my slides set. Is your own story here in Utah, actually. The, it's the story of what you've done with care by design uh, in the clinics you really started from, from deep, deep, deep in the red a few years ago when I first came to visit. And you built medical home across your communities um, in such a way that the kind of care that was described by John is the kind of care I saw yesterday for my employees. So this is going to run on itself, so I'm just going to let it run and talk later. Rocked by recession, the city of Hobbs was sorely in need of a source of new jobs. So one day the mayor stood up on his stump and suggested a plan to get them out of this slump. I've read the reports and seen the predictions from the Bureau of Labor and their statisticians that jobs in the sector of healthcare are rising. 
by thousands per day, with experts surmising this trend in employment can only get bigger. As the nation gets older, it's bound to get sicker. So how can we profit from this demographic? The answer is obvious, hospital traffic. We'll get out of towners to come here when they ache with a medical complex, best in the state. Thus, the more good healthcare jobs will create. The city did just what the mayor had envisioned. Tax breaks followed by cutting of ribbons on a medical complex so modern and new it caused wonder in all who walked through it. The top floor was the brain. Below that, the nose. The bottom floor studied the stubbing of toes. Ouch. While the mayor just waited for those tourists to visit, he spied through his spyglass something rising. What is it? Just in yonder city, 12 miles up the river, they built up their hospital tower even bigger with a special addendum, a surgical spire that climbed an additional 50 feet higher for hearts to be paced, spines to be spaced, kneecaps replaced, brain waves retraced. They even gave complimentary massage to anyone left waiting in the parking garage. It was just so much fancier. It had their spot beat. The mayor was nervous. He smelled his defeat. He had to compete with this terrible spire. But how? What's this? He had to acquire the all-organ blast and make younger machine. It had just been invented. Extremely expensive. Did it work? No one knew. It was still being tested. The point was they'd have what the other town lacked, and thus the more patients and jobs they'd attract. The town was in favor, but a man in a suit stood and said, My dear mayor, your plan is a hoot. Huh? This arms race you've run with your upriver rival does threaten to dun our financial survival. This medical tourist you seek is a fiction. It doesn't exist. When people are sick, then they go to the place that their doctor suggests. They don't drive around the state to shop for the best. And these wings and these towers you've been able to grow means locals use more. That means more dough that businesses must pay for their workers' insurance. So forgive me, dear mayor. I need more assurance that this competitive fervor that's rattled your saber won't end up quite badly for business and labor. The mayor just nodded. Mm -hmm. He'd heard words to consider, but the sound of the pounding of nails from upriver made the mayor conclude. Well, to heck with the cost. If Hobbs doesn't get these new jobs, we're lost. And so it resumed the grand competition. The two rival cities consumed by ambition, the one with its tower, the other its spire, each one expanding its hospital higher, much more than the region would seem to require. Till even the mayor didn't know what to write on the hospital billboard they lit up at night. Could he say his was tallest or just second best? He must climb to the top to wreck it a test. But as he climbed to the top to spy that town's spire and find out for certain whose building was higher, just then the clouds parted. He could see the whole nation and so many cities boosting healthcare occupations. But if all these mayors were fueling the fire, then who would be paying for these towers and spires? And what if this medical boom might inflate the size of the debt of the feds and the state? Well, heck, thought the mayor. Why should he schwitz? That was Washington's problem to fix. So this is the point of view uh, of business um, that I represent um, around the care delivery system that we get. <laughs> so On January 27th of this year, you might not have heard it, but the world changed. The world changed when WellPoint announced, WellPoint is the largest of the blues. Um, they're one of the largest plans in the country. WellPoint announced that the standard of care that they were going to be building their future on was that of the patient center medical home. They were no longer going to give an uplift in fee-for-service. Um, any uplift would be in outcomes and value. Um, 
the, that <clears throat> was the 39th market in the blues to say that. That's most of the blues. Um, in that same article in the Wall Street Journal, um, Aetna said, and we're doing the same, um, the reporter, Ann, contacted United and said, you know, what, do you have any comment? They didn't at that particular day. But on the 8th of February, they said, we see you 10 and raise you 10. So that's most of the major <clears throat> health care plans. So what's behind that is that little video skit you just saw from Ways and Means, right? The, the, that, the journey of asking <clears throat> us, the buyers, asking uh, the plans to do that. About seven years ago, uh, around the swimming pool with my big bosses at IBM, we began asking ourselves a fundamental question of what it was we bought, why, and how. And, and, and we decided that we were doing a pretty dumb thing with the way we bought our health care. Uh, we were paying for an episode of care when what we really wanted was a population that was managed. Uh, you know, we, we really concluded that to try to take a diabetic or somebody with a chronic disease and, and address them, you know, in a, in a, a design of delivery that was 50 years old around an episode of an acute process wasn't something that made sense anymore. In fact, it, it was unethical, it was immoral for us to ask for an episode of care for somebody who needed to be managed, unethical, immoral. <clears throat> so w we decided that we really wanted to change the covenant between the providers and the buyers of care. And, and we gathered together 47 of the Fortune 100 plus TRICARE plus the Office of Personnel Management. We met in Washington and we asked the House of Medicine, the House of Primary Care, those who should be the comprehensivists delivering that managed care, um, into the room, and we asked for a change of covenant. We, we said we would really like to be able to buy something different than an episode of care. We would really like to have comprehensive, integrated, coordinated, and accessible care for our employees. Um, and, and, and it was extremely touching because across the table from us were, were, were pediatri any pediatricians in the room? Pediatrics, family medicine, internal medicine. So across the table were those guys, right? All you guys. And Doug Henley, the head of the AAFP, said to me, bless your heart. I now know, because I've been in the South a few times, it means two things, but... <laughs> we were thinking of the same thing. You know, we called it the future of family medicine, and we couldn't understand why you paid us the way you paid us, because our patients needed to be managed. And the internist said, you know, we, we've also been working on this. We call it advanced medical home. And down at the very end of the table, Fan Tate from pediatrics, in a very small voice, as pediatricians do, said, we've been doing this for 30 years. We call it a medical home. Nobody's listened to us. A place in the delivery system where data can flow as actionable information and be held accountable at the point of care. Simple, easy. And, and we said, we the buyers, said, that's great but we can't have all three of you doing it separately. By this time, the osteopaths had joined us as, as well. So the, the four primary care societies, or the three plus the osteopaths, uh, basically um, sat down and gave us uh, something called the Joint Principles of the Medical Home, um, which is the foundation that we're talking about now. So when WellPoint made that announcement, um, I, I attended a strategy meeting with them in Chicago uh, with all of the blues markets that were there. And, and this was their vision. This is their vision. This is the plan's vision. This is where we've arrived at 
as of today. This is how the world has changed. Now, in Utah, not so much. Because, you know, there, you happen to be sitting in a, in, in a market in which the blues haven't, they're not one of those 39 markets, but we're talking to them later today. And by the way, we didn't give them a single life, right? So, you know, and neither will the other 47 large companies if they don't come around, because that's what we want to buy. We no longer want to buy an episode of care. We want to buy a care. We want to buy this vision, right? So this was also some data that they presented that day. And this was just, a, this was just you know, a week or so ago in Tucson, Arizona, with all the blues are there. So 18% decrease in hospitalization for, and the control group was an 18% increase. A delta of 36% across the blues in Colorado, New Hampshire, and New York. 15% decrease in emergency room and a 4% increase in the control group, so a 19% delta. An ROI that's pretty impressive. In fact, the actuaries in the room that day said, you know, we have a hard time believing this is the best ROI we've seen for any pilot we've ever done. And if we cut it in half, we would be gaga. So that's the kind of care we're going to buy. That's the kind of care you're going to have to deliver. Is that clear to everybody? This isn't a conversation, right? This is, this is what's going to happen. So I stood up in front of the leadership of all the academic medical centers in Philadelphia uh, a few months ago, the CEOs, the, the administrators, the, and, and, I, and I said, what happens to you guys when you insist on delivering a product we no longer want to buy or can afford to buy? i never seen so many crossed arms in my life. Right? I looked across the crowd. I said, you cross your arms all you want. But you better listen, because I'm the buyer. And the lady who was introducing me on the panel was from Harvard. And she said to me, we're really special. <laughs> we're really special. And I said, you are really special. In fact, you're so special that we are actually talking to our benefit folks right now about redlining you. In fact, we're looking at a benefit design where somebody who wants you is going to pay $450 more a month for the right to have how special you are. You see how many people will sign up for that. In the value proposition you're giving us isn't there. And, you know, this is a conversation that's been going on for a long period of time. My colleague Andrew happens to be uh, from Harvard, practices there, teaches there, and uh, I guess it must have been about three weeks ago that I was with the dean at Harvard, and he looked across the table from me and he said, Paul, he said, the, the most important thing that I'm going to leave my legacy with here at Harvard is redesigning primary care. I, I was in a meeting at Duke with 11 of the academic medical centers, and, and um, uh, Herb from Columbia Cornell said, I don't know about this. I think we want to just continue to focus on head transplant research. <laughs> and and, and the, 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 folks, the folks around the table were the leadership of all the federal agencies. We had, we, we had Mary Wakefield from HRSA. We had, we had um, uh, Kathleen Sebelius from, from, from HHS. We, we had the head of the, the DOD, um, a, a physician from Boston that's now the assistant secretary. Um, we had uh, Gordon, who, who is Assistant Secretary for the Veterans Administration, and everybody had gone around the room and said, this was a workforce meeting, everybody went around the room and said, this is the workforce we're going to need. I mean, we're going to need to have our kids trained to deliver population management. They're going to have to work together as a team. They're going to have to be able to use data. They're going to have to be able to manage a population because all of us have migrated to the medical home as the concept of the delivery model, right? So the workforce is going to have to deliver that. And, and uh, Herb said, well, I don't know if we want to do that. 
And the head of the NIH was there, and he looked across the table and he said, Herb, this ain't a conversation. We're not asking you. We're telling you. And 2013, if by that time, if you're not making that move, we're going to start deducting your grants by 10%, because this is the workforce you're going to have to have. There's going to be teeth in this. Right? I mean, the VA just told you, you know, we're going to hire folks that are going to deliver patient-centered medical home. They call it patient-aligned care teams, which is another long story, but, it, you know, so that's the workforce you're going to have to deliver. So it was, it was a very interesting conversation. It was one of those camp room meetings where we were there for three days. We did that sort of uh, Macy Foundation conversation. And, and Victor Zhao, who was the CEO of Duke, looked across the table at me and he said, Paul, he said, how fast can we do this, right? So, so, so there's a lot of movement, and I, and I was privileged to, to meet with many of the folks at the academic medical centers, and I think there's at least eight or ten of them now that are at least looking at redesigning this for their own employees, right? So they begin to learn how to do this. So this was the, this was the uh, a slide that was also at that meeting in Arizona uh, from the Blues. This was presented uh, by uh, the strategist from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. And, and, and the conversation there is that this is an absolute no-brainer. This is pretty easy to do when you're looking at a 30% waste. Not so hard to take out some cost if, you know, you're dealing with 30% waste. Um, and from the standpoint of the healthcare plans, from the standpoint of us as a buyer, Articles like this have really challenged them to step up and deliver a value proposition beyond a network. So there's really going to be two kind of schemes that go forward uh, in time. You're going to have some integrated systems that are willing to take on more risk. So, you know, eventually they'll get a single check, right, from CMS. That's the Pioneer program. They'll get a single check. They're going to have to manage their costs with a single check from CMS, right? That's an accountable care organization. So that's the top down from the hospitals. Bottom up is parts of the country that, that aren't ready to take risk, that can't, aren't prepared to take risk. What the health plans are saying is that we will help manage that by help you build a medical home, expose the medical homes to total cost, Huh? and reward you for delivering better upstream care, for managing a population, and being willing to put barbed wire around unnecessary services. Grand Junction, Colorado, if you read the Atul Gwande article, that's Grand Junction, Colorado. So, you know, you, you, you can do it one way or the other. Bottom up, top down, accountable care organization, take your own risk as, a, as an institution, or, or work with a plan, and allow them to continue to take the risk while you figure out how to do this. But the base of both of those, whether it's an accountable care organization or whether it's, whether it's the medical home plan, the basis of that, the foundation of that is a medical home. It has to be, there's no other way to do it. I sat with the 10 PGP uh, hospitals a few months ago in Chicago. The PGPs are the guys that are the pre-ACOs, you know, uh, Marshall Clinic, Everett Clinic, um, 10 of them around the country. Marshfield is the only one that got every dime that CMS awarded. Um, Billings, Montana is another one, one of those. And, and they talked about their experience. They talked about their journey, what was successful. They, they said, issue number one of the 10 things is a medical home. You've got to have a medical home. You've got to have that foundation of primary care. You've got to be able to understand what you're doing. And number two, you've got to have the data. You've got to understand the data, right? And there's not a lot of places that are prepared to sort of do either. Um, so, so that's the journey that, that, that we're on. Um, th there is a number of factors that are driving this. Um, one factor is, is the cost, and we'll talk about that in a bit. We already talked about it a bit. But, but the other important driving factor of, of, I think, the three key driving factors is data. You see, for the first time in history, we're going to have the data. 
We tried to manage before in the HMO movement, and by the way, there's still folks that are doing that pretty well. I mean, there's still Kaiser, there's still Intermountain, there's still, there's still Geisinger that, that do that, right? Um, but for most of us and most of America, we didn't have the data. Now we're going to have the data. We do have the data. I mean, tools like Watson, if you saw that Jeopardy game, are going to do for your minds, your patients' minds. You know, in the kids who I sat around the table with yesterday who were in medical school and we had the chats, they're going to do for their minds what imaging has done for their eyes in my generation. It's going to open them up. It's going to put data at the point of care that's actionable and deliverable. No longer will the medical students need to be data repository storage units, right? I mean, it's a huge shift in what happens, right? So, so, so the, the training is going to have to be around, you know, how, how do you keep, teach these medical students about relationships, about difficult diagnostic dilemmas, about sorting out things, and not about how much data you can store about your limited specialty area because, you know, that's part of the reason why we've gotten so specialized is because it's so complicated and complex. I mean, tools like this can sort through 400 million pages of structured or unstructured data in 0.3 microseconds. I mean, it's just phenomenal what's, what's going to happen. And, um, you know, Mike is uh, one of the advisors on the Watson tool. We're really looking at it very, very closely around, around how we're going to use this. How, how, how is this valuable? So this is, this, this is, again, the foundational strategy that was outlined in the blues uh, on meeting that day. There are really three stools, that three legs to the stool that we need to look at. We need to look at practice transformation, which Mike and you guys have been doing. You're, you're leading the nation in that, in care by design. When I, I mean, the, 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 the capacity that you have in your primary care, the, the leadership that you've shown is just phenomenal. That's why I'm so proud to be affiliated with you. I brag about you all over the country. So that's the practice redesign. So the other elements that have to occur is benefit redesign. So that's my job, right? That's the job of the HR person in your hospital. That's the job of the people who face what it is you deliver. In, in an experiment we're doing with, you know, with Michigan, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Michigan, University of Michigan is an employer, IBM is an employer. You know, we, we have a benefit design where, where our, our folks wear a pedometer. And we give them like really low rates if they will exercise, right? We, we have programs where they teach their kids how not to be fat. We have obesogenesis for families. They take those, those courses, you know, they get low rates because, you know, we see the risk factors going down. Now, when we first did that, you know, we, we offered that to our employees. We said, you know, we've got this program where, you know, you can get your health care for free. You just have to do these things. Well, free is pretty good, right? So that's kind of a bit of a bribe. And 36% of them like grumbled and complained and said, oh, yeah, but they signed up anyway because it was free. You know, they're now our champions. I mean, those are the guys that said, thank God you got us off our butt. Got us moving, right? So you need to think about the benefit redesign. How are you going to structure the cost and, and, and focus on the patient? I mean, look, I mean, if I was the travel guy in IBM in charge of travel, and I designed my travel such that, you know, there was a $50 deductible. You could travel any way you wanted to. I mean, how many in this room wouldn't travel first class? I mean, come on, right? I mean, that's the kind of stuff that we've done. We've, we've reinforced absolutely the worst thing. So, and then payment reformation is part of what was the conversation at Ways and Means, and that's the conversation with the healthcare plans who have to pay differently. That's the conversation that's going on with CMS today. We have six programs just for medical home alone. Comprehensive primary care initiative, plan-driven, advanced primary care, you know, eight states are involved in those pilots. The data is the same that we're seeing here, right? It's really cool data. 
So this is a really important graph. This was in Health Affairs in October 2010. This shows 15 years of life from age 40 on, so it eliminates infant mortality and all those other kinds of issues. And, and, and it shows it by cost. It's the best indicator of how valuable the delivery system is. And, 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 and if you look at us, I, 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 you know, in my lifetime in IBM, in, in doing this job, where we started, you look at us and, and where we've gone, we're dead last at twice the price. We're dead last at twice the price. But if you look down there um, around Australia and Japan and Switzerland, you'll see that there's parts of the United States that aren't doing so bad. You'll see Dubuque, Iowa, you see Ogden, Utah. What's going on there? Hill Air Force Base, right? <laughs> you know, so, so it's now reached a point, you guys, in terms of the cost concern that my CFO, my CEO has about healthcare, that we look at stuff like this and this is where we put our jobs. No governor wants to hear that if they're up there, right? <laughs> right? They want to hear it if they're down here. I, 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 I uh, get calls probably twice a month from one of the Fortune 100 companies asking us, where, where are you looking for, to put your jobs? I mean, Boeing put jobs in South Carolina and Palmetto Primary Care was delivering medical home and we were seeing, you know, data like this. I mean, we put 4,000 jobs in Dubuque, Iowa. Am I looking at Ogden, Utah? You bet I am. I mean, so, so no longer is this a benefits issue. No longer is this, you know, about health care. This is about your jobs. This is about the sucking sounds of having them or not having them. You know, this, this is about a cost issue for us. When it gets to the point where my CFO wants to know, you know, health care costs as part of their strategy of where they're going to, you know, we're looking at bringing a call center back from India because of the way the labor structure is, right? Yeah. Where are we going to look? So this is the elephant in the room. This is the, this is the projection we're on that we can't, we can't stay on. Um, this is the affordability gap that's happened over the last 10 years. Uh, this was a, a study that was done um, by RAND. By the way, this cost has really been transferred to employees from employers. And in the last 10 years, every cent of increased payment salary has gone to this gap. We, again, according to the RAND. So, I visited a major academic center on the East Coast, um, and as I drove up, there was a giant sign on that front of the freeway. It said, we do the best heart surgery in the state. I went into that hospital. I met with the leadership. I sat around the table with all the O's, the CEO, the CFO, all the O's. And, and I said, you know, we're not ever going to put another job in this community. It isn't going to happen. In fact, we're moving jobs out of this community. That's not the sign I want to see. I want to see a sign that says we do the most comprehensive, coordinated, integrated care. We do it so well that your employees need to have heart surgery one third less often. And we have places in the United States right now where we see that. Look, it's not rocket science. It's discipline around managing a population. It's the ABCs, it's aspirin, it's blood pressure, it's cholesterol, right? I mean, it's not rocket science. I, I know exactly what that sign said, I said to the CEOs. I know mean, exactly what you're telling me. You're telling me you know where the high-end procedures are and you're going after it. In, in some ways, you can't blame them because that's the structure that we put in place that's now changing and will change. 
We can't f afford to do that anymore. We can't sustain to do that anymore. And it's toxic and dangerous to boot. There's an inverse relationship in my data between how expensive the healthcare is and how dangerous it is. Lots of data around that, right? I mean, we do the best partialty care in the world. We should be proud of that. We should continue to do the best partialty care in the world. We do darn good livers. People come here from outside the country to do, get their livers done. We do darn good knee, knees and hips. I, I don't want to change that. I think that that's important to do. But my employees have more than a liver. I mean, it's dangerous. It's toxic in an environment where I have five partialists all working on my employee with no adult supervision, <laughs> no coordination of care, no integration of care, right? No follow-up. I mean, you know, I have five people that are prescribing five different medications and there's zero coordination many, many times. It's dangerous, it's toxic, it's expensive, it's wasteful. So, we, we, really, we really that day made a decision that we were going to fundamentally change the covenant of what we bought. We asked the House of Primary Care to give us a set of, 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 of principles. They gave us these. They're the joint principles of the medical home. They're immensely powerful. They're immensely powerful because they're now the standard of care in the DOD. They're now the standard of care in the Veterans Administration. They're the standard of care in six countries, by the way, including Canada. Um, and, and you just saw what the health care plans said they're going to do, right? So last fall, uh, the Fortune 100 companies that I work with in the PCPCP. So now you saw the data, right? Great data. Why wouldn't you do that? Last fall, we, we took our RFP process, request for proposal. We took the data from the o Office of Personnel Management, the largest employer in the country, the federal government, their carrier letter, which demands a medical home, right? So, so, so I'll show you that later. We took that information and we put it in our RFP every day for over three months, every business day, every major plan in the country, got a Federal Express envelope from one of the Fortune 100 demanding in their RFP this kind of care every single day. So this is where we're at. We have some states. Um, we have over half of the physicians that are either a medical home or well on their way. In Utah we have four. We have we have um, care by design, your primary care clinics that are all in the process. So we have some work to do here, but, but it's really made a tremendous amount of progress. And I think that what's cool about Utah is that, you, you know, you're already in, in, in a great position to take advantage of this, to really begin to seize this and market yourself. I mean, this is, you know, you already have some real strengths. Uh, uh, and you already have the process in place, and you already have, you know, folks on how to do integrated care. So, so I, mean, I think that you can really advantage, uh, you can really advantage this. I was, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was down in, in uh, Louisiana with Blue Cross Blue Shield Louisiana talking to the CEOs of all of the, of all of the hospitals there and the leadership of the state. And sitting on my right was Dow, and on my left was Exxon. And it was, you know, they, they, they're the largest employers in Baton Rouge, right? So this is, for us, a no-brainer. This is the cumulative kind of data that we're seeing. We're seeing this in pilot after pilot after pilot. This is why, you know, you just saw that from the Blues pilot. This is just sort of from our outcomes. We're, we're re redoing it again this year. This is the kind of data you see. Mayo Clinic uh, is the largest employer in Rochester. We're the second largest employer in Rochester, Minnesota, IBM is. And we've been working together uh, with them as an employer. You know, in, in the four years that we've been doing that, the nation has experienced a trend line of 31% up, 31% up in healthcare. Our trend line 
for our employees, for their employees, is zero. That's bending the curve. Why would we, why wouldn't we want to buy that? Um, this is Care More. Uh, this is an extensivist kind of program. This is where you really begin to focus on your sickest of your sick. Uh, this is a this is a practice in California. It's owned by WellPoint, and, and they have practices in Arizona and Nevada. You, you know, they really pay attention to detail managing their populations. I visited one of their clinics. They go out into the. They they really have home care workers. And, and, and when, a, you know, when a diabetic gets a nick on their foot, they tend to it right away. They have 60% less amputations for their diabetics, 60% less complications for their chronic disease. You know, we, we really manage these patients out of the hospital. We manage them at home. We manage them well. 60% less amputations. I mean, that's Zsa, Zsa Gabor with a leg to stand on. Probably people in this room are too young to remember Zsa Zsa Gabor. Green Acres, you know. <laughs> so in Ways and Means, if you listen to the rest of that testimony, you would hear from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. They're, they're probably one of the ones that's the furthest along in a state plan. They have, they have uh, probably close to 70% of their docs in the medical home, and this is where we're doing some of our, our benefit redesign uh, with them. Again, this is the kind of data that they're seeing. Uh, in Michigan. I don't know if I need to do anything more to convince you guys though. So if you look at a hospital as an employer, this is the Midwest Hospital um, and, and you know they have, they have uh, about 12,000 uh, employees. They're, they're a major academic uh, medical center, major hospital and, and they put in medical home. This is their trend line. Huh? This, is, this is their cost line for their employees. And they took this, they took this, and they went out to the local shipbuilding company, because it happens to be on the Great Lakes, and, 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 they, and they also went out to the school board, and they also went out to the state as an employer, and they also went out, you know, to some of the other companies, a hundred miles away from them, built this for them, right? They said, this is what we do for our employees, you know, you really, we can offer you a value, that's what, that's what Mayo's doing too, right? So it's in fact, there's six or seven academic medical centers. So, you know, when, when I go to a hospital now and I meet with the leadership of the hospital and I ask the question, why should I put any of my employees in your beds, right? Because that's the question. The first thing I ask is, what's your trend line? I mean, what are you doing for your own employees? I mean, look, that's the one place in the system where it's entirely your cost, right? That's entirely your cost. I mean, you know, you're, it's out of your profit that you're paying for that cost. I mean, I mean, are you doing anything about your own cost? On average, the academic medical centers are 22% above the average trend line, right? 22%. Mayo Clinic, when we started this, when, I, when we went and looked at this, we said, you know, how are you managing your population? Oh, our people just show up in the emergency room, right? They just go to a specialist. Not anymore. Not anymore. So this is the delta. This is what happens when you do that and you don't do that. Um, great article. Uh, anybody here read the Atul Gawande article, Cost Conundrum? If you haven't, you should. It's, it's what the president carried around. Everybody said, you know, look at this, look at this. It was very cool. He's a good writer. Actually, he, he and I are both going to get that NCQA award. I'm real excited about that. But Atul Gawande, uh, um, you know, looked at Dartmouth Atlas data. He looked at Medicare data comparing, comparing uh, cost. This is my lives. This is commercial lives. This is the under 65 crowd or they don't need kidney stuff, right? So, um, you know, this is, this is my commercial lives. And it's interesting because here, McAllen, Texas, which was actually one of the most expensive uh, places in Atul's article, is one of the cheapest. It's the third cheapest in, in commercial lives. Any idea in the audience why? Fascinating. Can anybody tell me why? 
fraud, Medicare fraud. I, I mean, they're shifting away from the commercial lives to the Medicare lives, right? And if you Google Medicare fraud in McAllen, Texas, you'll see page after page where Peter Bedetti is in charge of integrity at, at CMS, where they're now perking people and they're making that stuff visible. They arrested a cardiologist there, they perked him for doing stents on normal hearts. Why? Because Medicare was an easy mark, right? There are places in the country where you actually have criminal rings that do this, right? So, so that, and, and, and that, that's, in, that's in a fraud belt. So what we're talking about, and I don't know how much more time I have, but I can go on all day, four, four minutes. So what we're talking about is, is a system integrator. We're talking about a place in the delivery system where data can flow and be held accountable, right? At the point of care, at the fundamental coal phase in a healing relationship with a doc who does what they've always wanted to do as a comprehensivist, and that's manage their patients and manage their population with simple tools to do that, like a registry, right? When I moved to the Hudson Valley, um, I asked my primary care doc, you know, how many, how many women were over 55 and how they tracked them for their mammograms. And he said, you know, we, we have no clue how many are even in our practice, let alone who are over 55. And yet, I, and yet when I took my cat to the vet, my cat had a registry and it got notified in the news examinations. <laughs> and, you know, last July, my wife was sent a message saying she needed her mammogram and she went and got it. She had a small lesion. Uh, you know, I'm going to fly home on the 27th for her mastectomy. Um, and she had her chemo already because she was her septum pops positive, but it wasn't in the nodes and it's palliative. I mean, it, and, it, and it's adjunct, not palliative, right? And I asked her, you know, hey Juan, would you have shown up for your mammogram if you didn't have a simple reminder? She said, probably not. That's what we're talking about. It's as simple as that, you guys. We're talking about, you know, the ability to think about who your population is and manage it. We're talking about teaching our kids here at the University of Utah to begin to think about more than an episode of care. To begin to think about, you know, who you're responsible for to have the discipline to follow up and follow through. That's the fundamental basis. Thank you very much. Do I have time for questions? I'll have three minutes, I hope. Sir. Yeah, uh, you've made a compelling argument, and there's no objection to the uh, uh, obvious benefits of coordination and integration. Uh, but given the fact that the delivery of ineffective and unnecessary care is the major part of the unnecessary cost, and given human cognitive limitations and the fact that clinicians, particularly for chronic disease patients who have multiple problems very commonly, can you make, you, you haven't talked about the tools necessary to help clinicians make the evidence-based decisions. In other words, what about decision support with adequately explicit or reproducible methods that would enable the clinician who is already overwhelmed and will be more overwhelmed with all the genomic and other information that's coming down the pipeline. Yeah, uh, that's an extremely good point. And I think I, think I, I kind of made that point a little bit, but didn't dwell on it a lot. The error we are now in getting at data and turning it into actual information is extremely primitive. I mean, it's like extremely primitive. But even in places now, I could take you to Marshfield Clinic where, where, where you would have a dashboard and you would, you would have information that would be actionable, that would be very easy to access, Southeast Texas Medical Association practice there. There are places that I could take, take you and, and you could easily look at your population and, and highlighted in red would be the things that you needed to focus on that day.
you know, beginning to make it much easier for you to track and follow and manage a population. You see, most of those chronic diseases that are most expensive to us, like diabetes and, 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 and congestive heart failure, they're not difficult diagnostic dilemmas. I mean, they're not difficult, you know, for you to manage as a diagnostician. Um, you know, the, what's lacking is, is, is the discipline of managing them, and that takes a huge amount of cost out of it. So the other thing, the other thing when I talk to primary care docs around the country, and I ask them, you know, who overutilizes, you know, who, who really does, they all know. They all know. They, they know. They know who they would send their mother to and who they wouldn't. But you begin to give them that kind of data. That's what Blue Cross Blue Shield in Maryland is doing. Chuck, Chet Burrell, the CEO there, it has a simple tool where the primary care physicians get the, exposed to total cost. They're shown the beds in the area and they, and they know exactly how much those beds cost. They're shown, they're shown the imaging costs in the area. They're shown the data around, you know, how often somebody uses those images. So, so there's going to be a lot more actionable information that will be made available uh, over time as these plans begin to roll out. But it's, but it's early and primitive. Yes? Um, I'm a child psychiatrist, and my focus... Bless your heart. <laughs> but my area of work is child maltreatment. And over the past 15, 20 years, we have an increasingly strong scientific uh, evidence for the role of bad things that happen to people in driving bad health conditions and diseases. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, replicated in the <coughs> Times in Washington State, Wisconsin. A uh, study just recently out of the Netherlands showing that the effects of uh, adverse things in childhood cause more burden of disease than all other common mental health conditions combined. I see this change as not just affecting the practice of medicine, but also public health. Yes. For the first time, prevention that really works to diminish the long-term harms of things like violence and abuse is economically incentivized. Uh, I, I, I completely agree with that. In fact, we're seeing those trends happen um, uh, in places, um, and Mike is looking nervous. Um, but, but, but I would encourage you to look at the Blueprint for Health in Vermont. The Blueprint for Health in Vermont takes 1.9 cents out of every sick care dollar and uses it to, f to, to, to fund not-for-profits in e each community that focuses on those kinds of issues. It's called a a community care coordination team. And, and there's an integration of the public health department. There's an integration of recommendations from the CDC. And, and I was in Burlington where we happen to be the largest employer in Vermont from the standpoint of a, of a company. I mean, I think the state is a large employer, but a corporate employer. And so I do a lot of work there. And, I, and we were working really closely with, with the governor there. So I visited one of these facilities, one of these medical homes, and the, and the care coordinator office was in, located in this medical home. And, and, and she was gathering together the four newly diagnosed diabetics in that community. And she was going to take them to the head of the rail trail, which the community had just developed using this program. And there's like a little club where these diabetics would get together on Tuesday morning and hike, right? And, and, then the, and then she was going to take those folks to the grocery store and do like a tour of the grocery store. So you're beginning to see an integration of health and, and sick care, right? So you have health care and sick care or public health and sick care. And in Spain, they've completely redesigned their whole, their whole system around that. So it's family and community medicine. And, and, um, and each, of the, each of the primary care docs has a signed responsibility of at least four hours a week where they work in the health department or they're advisor to the local legislature around health issues. So they begin to think, they think in terms of population management. And, and I visited one of those clinics. We had, the, we had the Minister of Health from Spain come and talk to us. Uh, in fact, Jeff, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Mike's counterpart in Rhode Island, uh, had done some consulting with them and he came and spoke to us. And then I went and visited the clinic. There were three names on a whiteboard. And I said to the young lady there, who are those names? She said, oh, oh, those are the three women that have been contacted by email, by mail, and by phone, and they haven't come to get their breast exam. And so we're sending a car out to pick them up, right? That, that's population management. One more. 
One more. I'm sure you've studied this, and I'm sure there's an answer, and I think it's a good answer probably, but be explicit. I'm involved still with the privilege of teaching uh, medical students and uh, some classes in family practice. Are we asking these people to be glorious martyrs in their life and give their life like a uh, wonderful Catholic priest uh, opening a center in darkest Africa to treat the people that need it there? Are we asking people to martyr themselves when the cost of getting educated is higher than it's ever been before? I think you can assure us on that, but please do. I, I think uh, I can assure you on that. I think, first of all, the world that that our primary care students are going to be moving into is a world where they're going to be part of a team um, and they love it, right? It's, it's really much better. But, but I think the other thing is when we move to this system, when we begin to think about this, primary care has real power. All of a sudden it's not just an afterthought. And we're already seeing a shift, right? So if you look at the what's behind the the comments from WellPoint, we're already seeing a shift in increase in payment for primary care and an increase in value for primary care. Uh, look, my total spend in primary care is 5% of my total cost. What I'm telling the health care plans is that, that it needs to be 20%. When it's 20%, right? When, when there are systems where that is the kind of ratio that you have, and by law, by the way, in Rhode Island, that's now the case. The, the, the insurance commissioner says all the health care plans have to spend that much in primary care because that's the way systems work. When you begin to see that, you see this sort of stuff, right? When you only spend 5%, when you don't focus on primary care, you don't have an infrastructure. So we're, we're going to see a huge shift. I, I, you know, I'm sorry for those who are, you know, those who are, who are cosmetic dermatologists in, in, the, in the audience, but... Um, I, I mean, I'm sorry, but you're not worth a million dollars to me. I don't want to pay that anymore. Thank you. What role do you see nurse Oh, they're they're playing a fantastic role. We have we have many pilots with that are nurse practitioner led, um, and, and and fascinating because when I was here a couple of years ago and I went out to one of your clinics, you know, up in some beautiful ski area. Um, why not? Um, you, you know, and, and I watched how the professionals interact with each other, how they manage their patients. They focused on two things the clinicians did, the, the nurse practitioners and, and the physicians. They focused on difficult diagnostic dilemma and relationships, and the rest of the team did everything else. But, you know, I looked at the dynamics of how that place ran. The fact of the matter is it was run by a nurse practitioner, right? She, she was the one that had the skills to manage it, and she was managing it, and it was flat. So, so that's in a team, but I also see places around the country where, you know, you have nurse practitioner-led teams, uh, medical homes that are led, led by nurse practitioners. I mean, so, I mean, I think, I think that, that, you know, you have, you know, unlimited capacity um, to get involved in this. Um, we, you know, in the, in the, um, in the Accountable Care Act, um, in the Advanced Primary Care Initiative, um, Congresswoman Shorts put nurse practitioners right in there as part of the test program. That's being tested now. You should f make sure that you follow that. The, the National Association of Nurse Practitioners, um, Jane Tyler and those guys, they're, they're, they're leading the charge on that. It's very exciting. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. I uh, do have one announcement I need to make for the family medicine residents who are going to be meeting with uh, Dr. Uh, Morris Singer. Uh, the meeting will be held in the Ensign boardroom to follow shortly, just in the next five or ten minutes. Margie, if you can point folks to that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>